guys, it's Ellie with Chaos Monkey, and we are going to, how am I going to word this? We're, I'm going to show you how I do two at a time socks. Now this is not a tutorial, so if you do not know how to knit socks, this is not to teach you how to knit socks. This is just showing how I do two at a time, how I get them on my needles, and what I do to get them started. Um, I'm obviously not going to knit the entire pair of socks on video, but I at least want to get it started just to show you what I do. So this is definitely for people who already know how to sew, how to, how to, sew, how to knit socks um, and do all the basic stitches and all of that stuff. Okay, and if you are looking into making socks, you know, please watch just because if you're curious, um, you can see how I do it, what I use, and all of that. If you are new to sock knitting, I do suggest doing one at a time socks. Um, pref probably top down for your first pair, um, and then you're going to have to try to figure out how you want to do your heels. I started doing mine um, top down one at a time with a um, heel flap and gusset, which is a traditional way to do socks. And I eventually evolved into this because I do I don't like doing socks one at a time because what I end up doing is not wanting to make the second sock after the first sock is finished. So over time I learned, I kind of learned what works for me. Um, so just keep that in mind. So what we're going to do, this is what I do the majority of the time. I very rarely do a heel flap and gusset anymore. Sometimes I do do afterthought heels um, and you can do those two at a time as well. So it's just a matter of um, skipping the heel pretty much, putting in a placeholder and then finishing the sock like you normally would and then just going back in to cut the heels in so um, this works for basically uh, short row heels and for um, afterthought heels but not really for heel flap and gusset it is possible to do two at a time heel flap and gusset but it is tricky so I'm not showing how to do that I'm just showing how I do two at a time socks Okay. So the first thing I do is make sure that I'm starting on the same color because I like my stripes to match. So as you can see, I should probably show you what I'm using. I'm using Patton's Croy Socks. This is a very um, inexpensive, reliable, heavy duty sock yarn. And it's in purple haze. And they do have wool content. Um, where is the wool content? Where is my content on here? Ah, 75% washable wool, 25% nylon, which is what you want for a sock. These usually come in a 50 gram ball, so you're going to need two, of course, in order to make a pair of socks. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any other information you need. Not really. I mean, it's. I think it's technically super wash, but I wash them by hand, so... So what you do, um, in case you didn't know, if the label is, is reading this way, you pull from the right side if you want to do a center pull. If it's up and down, you pull from the top to get the, but always make sure you pull the other strand out of the bottom if it's tucked in. Then go in through the top and pull it out. So I pulled it out on both of these and got a little yarn barf. So I just wrapped it around the outside edge. Okay? Because I want them to be eventually be center pull. So once I get them caught up here off the um, the wrapping then it'll be all center pull. It's just I had to kind of wrap it up that way. So what I do is I just pull them out. If you hear banging that's my cat and I don't want to jump up and grab him real quick. So, um, Alright so as you can see this is two completely different color pinks so I don't want to start there. We're hitting a gray so I'm going to pull through the gray because I'm just not finding any colors to line up yet. Okay, so now I have a dark pink here, and I know I had a dark pink in the other ball. Oh no, I didn't. Same ball. Darn. Okay. So I'm going to keep pulling to see if we can get the colors lined up. And that's pretty much all what you have to do. So I got a light pink on one and dark pink on the other. They are starting on a completely different stripe, unfortunately. I'm still dark pink and gray, dark pink, dark pink, dark pink, and gray. 
So I pretty much got to get past this section to see where I can line them up. Okay, so we're dark pink to gray, and then I think we're going to go into purple. So for this side, light pink, gray, light pink, gray, light pink, gray, light pink, light pink. Okay, so now I'm hitting dark pink on this one. So what I'm going to do on the first one is back up because we had a dark pink here. So I'm just going to wind it, as you can see, right back around the ball. Try not to tangle anything. And we're going to back up. Because the first matching color out of both balls is the dark pink. And we're going to see if this will line up. Alright, so unfortunately, all the light pink and the gray is here. We couldn't line that up. But both have dark pink right here. So here's the gray and the dark pink. So I'm going to kind of pull them out together and see if they're going to match. Mm. All right, it looks all right. It looks like we're hitting gray. And it looks like we're hitting dark pink again. Yep, so we're good. But I always pull out for a couple of colors just to be on the safe side. And there's the gray. And there's dark pink. And I'm going to pull out until we get past the dark pink. So we're going to keep working until we get to the same color. So that's also dark pink. There's going to be a lot of mess in the beginning, by the way, because you're going to have to wind this all back up around the outside of the skeins. Or you could just put it on a ball winder. And see, now I know we're safe because we hit purple on both skeins. So I know that our colors are matching all the way through. Because sometimes you'll hit like a light pink and then it'll switch and trust me, it can get a little crazy. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to line up the purple and the gray and I'm just going to pull it back. Pull it back, pull it back, pull it back. These all match and we're going to pull it back until it doesn't match anymore. I'm going to try not to tangle it because we're going to end up cutting it so we start at the exact same part. So yeah, it does take a little effort um, to line them up by the stripes, but it's totally worth it, in my opinion, because it's not really difficult, it's just kind of tedious. And you will lose a tiny bit of yarn in most cases off of one ball, but that's fine, because you usually don't end up using the entire ball for a pair of socks anyway. Unless you have really, really large feet, you um, usually have some left over, even if you make a long cuff. Alright, so I lost my track here. Alright, so as you can see, both balls are at exactly the same spot. This is my first ball, just where it naturally started, and this is my second ball. So what we're going to do is we're going to snip it here with some scissors. My scissors are so dull. Okay. And so now we know, I'm going to drop those, and I'm going to go ahead and wind up the part I had to cut off. Just to get it out of the way, so it doesn't tangle anything. And this is always good yarn for putting things on hold or um, doing afterthought heels. Anytime you need some fingering weight just to kind of put some stitches on hold, this yarn always comes in handy, so I always save the scraps. So I pulled off more than I really wanted to, but still, it's not bad. It's not bad. So I'm just going to kind of wrap this up. So unfortunately, the casualty for one of the balls was um, a light pink and gray repeat, and that's what I pulled off. And again, I always reuse my scrap yarn as scrap yarn. So here, you can see that we've, we've got our stripes starting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap that yarn. You see how I'm center pulling? I'm going to wrap the yarn around the outside of the ball. Because as we're working, it'll just kind of pull off the top of the ball and uh, until we line back up until like we get it off of there and they're both pulling from the center. And I'm going to tangle this. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the camera and get these guys wound up so I can show you how to start. Okay, I'm back. All I did was just wind it up around the edges where it's easy to pull off as you're working um, and rewound them. And here we back we are and you need to pull both off at the same time. So now that I know my stripes are good, we need to start at the same place for both socks. 
Now I usually start with 12 cast on because I'm doing toe up. So I will pull off enough to start a Judy's Magic cast on for about 12 stitches. Now what I found is if you do the long tail cast on, it's pretty much the same way you would measure something for a long tail. The same amount of yarn. So for me, I probably pull out to about here, so that's like over a foot. And then I fold it, both strands, fold them in half, separate them, and so they're folded in the exact same spot. And what you want to do is take your second ball and put it somewhere where it stays folded because that's where you're going to need to put it over the needle. So you can put something on top of it just to hold it in place, like I'm going to put a pair of scissors over there. So you can see I just kind of put a pair of scissors on top of it. Um, and you're going to keep this folded because what you're going to do is take your needles. Now the needles I'm using are not my favorite, but they're what I had on hand. These are Addy Turbos, size zeros, with a 40 inch cord. Okay? And the reason I don't like these is because the Addy Turbos tend to bend. So you can see these are really bent. That's just from me using them. Um, not, you know what I mean? Um, so they're not my favorite. Your hand, they get warm in your hands, and if you're tight knitter like I am, they just bend. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold both needles together like this, okay? And on the back needle, I'm going to slip that loop and kind of hold it here. And I'm going to make sure that the short end is in front, which it is not. So I'm going to go ahead and just flip it onto the needle so that the short end is in front and I'm going to hold my needles like this. Now here's the weird thing, which is why I don't really like trying to show people how I do it, is because I'm not going to show you how to do Judy's Magic Cast On in slow detail. I will link videos down below to show you how to do Judy's Magic Cast On. Okay, because again, this is not a tutorial, this is just showing you how I do it for people who already knit socks. So, what I'm doing is trying not to lose my spot. Okay. What I do is very similar to a um, long tail cast on, but it's not. I don't know how to describe it, it's just how I evolved on how to do it. And I just do it. So that's why it's kind of difficult for me to teach people what I'm doing. Because it looks like a magic, um, it looks like a long tail cast on, but it's not. I just kind of evolved a way of twisting it a certain way onto the needle so that it works. So I'm not trying to teach you how to do that part. So I will link videos to Judy's Magic Cast On. Judy herself actually has videos where she does it in slow motion to teach you how to do it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. This is just how I did it, how I learned to do it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so I have 12 on each side of the needle. On each needle, I should say. And then what I do is twist it, because you have to twist your string around your main working yarn, otherwise it'll just come right off the needle. So we're going to twist that around just to kind of anchor it, and we're going to scoot that down the needle a little bit. Okay? And then what we're going to do is grab the other yarn right in our fold and we're going to put it on the back needle just like we did. And I'm going to make sure the short end is in front. Don't ask me why I do that. I'm sure I have a reason, which it is not. So I'm going to twist it. So I'm using my thumb to hold my, my first cast on firmly and out of the way. And I'm scooting it up and I'm doing the exact same thing but with the second yarn and try not to keep these too far apart. And then I do this. Don't ask me. Oops, hold on. Where's my front? Okay, hold on. Trying to keep these closer together. It's kind of hard because it, there is that curve in there that got bent into them, which is why I don't like using these. But my other good needles are on a, um, have socks on them, so. See, I don't even know what I do half the time. It's like autopilot. 
which is why I'm not trying to teach you guys the right way, because I do it weird. Oops. Okay, hold on a minute. I did not go where it's supposed to go. It does get fiddly, so you will see me kind of fiddle with it because it does get a little crazy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I'm not counting because I'm talking. <laughs> so we're going to say 10, 10, 11, 11, 12, 12, and that's just how many I like to start on my toes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, so I have twelve. And another quick way to check to make sure you're in the right spot is twist this one and then hold both your tails out to make sure one is not insanely longer than the other. And I do have a little bit of distance there that I don't like. Hold on, let me check. So I think one slipped out of my hand a little bit. So as you can see, I have maybe half an inch difference to an inch difference, but that's okay. That's not going to bother me too much. It'll still stripe pretty good, but if you have any more than that, your stripes will be way off. So, so I usually like to have them more lined up better than that, but like I said, it slipped out of my hands fiddling. So, so I'm going to get my cord out of the way. And as you can see, we have two socks cast on. Okay, I'm going to turn the needles upside down like that. So we cast on like this. I'm just turning them upside down, pulling the back needle out because, again, this is magic loop. So if I'm not teaching you how to do magic loop. I'm not teaching you how to knit socks. I'm just showing you what I'm doing. So this first row is going to be you're just going to knit into each one of those stitches. So you're just going to knit 12 across, try not to split the yarn. And this is just to anchor it down because when we do Judy's Magic Cast On, we're kind of just wrapping it and it could slip off very easily and get all crazy. Okay, so we're just anchoring it down. But what I do is something weird because of the way I cast on. So we're, this was just going to be... Oops! And I... I actually knit that with my tail. So that would be another thing is do not knit with your tail. Always check and I did not check because I'm talking to you guys. I'm a dum-dum. So I'm just going to tink this back gently because we don't want to lose any stitches because we'll have to start over. I'm a dum-dum. Always check to make sure you're starting with the tail and off the correct ball, too. Okay. Oh, and I split some yarn, too. Get that out of there. Okay. Tail out of the way. Working yarn in the way. Okay. All right. Make sure you're using your working yarn. Knit 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I like counting too because sometimes you'll drop a stitch and not realize it. And so here's what we've got so far. And then all you're going to do is work over to the other sock, drop your yarn, pick up your from the correct ball, and don't use the tail. I'm going to retwist it because it's starting to untwist. And I'm just going to scoot this over to get a little more needle. So we're going to need some more cord. Alright, and now we're going to knit 12 on the other one to help lock it down. One, two, three, oops, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's split the yarn, so hold on. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And again, very, very fiddly. So you might drop stuff and have to start over. That's fine, that'll give you practice on how to do a Judy's Magic cast on. Um, I would actually suggest for the first time maybe making these in worsted, your first pair two at a time, even if you've done socks before. Just because of the fiddliness, especially if you've ever done never done a Judy's Magic cast on. But that's totally up to you. So now I'm on the other side. So I worked this side, right here, turned it, and now we're on the other side because we're just using standard magic loop. But here's the thing I have to do. When I pull my needle out and I work the other side, I have to work through the back loop because the way I do my cast on is I twist my stitch. So in order to untwist my stitch, I have to knit through the back loop. You may not have to do that. That might just depend on how you do your Judy's Magic cast on. So again, why I'm trying not to teach anybody how to do this <laughs> is that I evolved a funky system that I know what to watch for and what I do and how I cast them on. Sorry, I'm trying not to split that first stitch. There we go. So as you can see, I don't know, if, you probably can't see because I have a crap camera, but um, I have to wait for it to focus. I think it wants to look at my fingernails. Well, anyway, it's not going to focus. But if you can see from here, it is on the, the needle wrong. It's, it's, yeah, it is twisted. So I am knitting through the back loop to get it onto the needles correctly. So my second side, I've always got to knit through the back loop when I first start because it's just the way I twist the yarn onto the needles doing the Judy's Magic cast on. So again, why I am not somebody to teach you to do everything from scratch in this particular case because I do things funky. Alright, so as you can see this is what it looks like in between and I really hope it focuses. And as you can see, you're making fabric, and there's no seam, which is why Judy's Magic Cast On is so much fun. Because when I do my toe, you can't, it doesn't look any different from the rest of the fabric. Because we're just doing the toe, both sides working this way out. And so that's why I do the Judy's Magic Cast On. So you can see the little teeny, very tip tip of the toe forming now. And so now I'm going to do my other side, and I'm going to remember to knit through the back loop just on this first round because after this it will be oriented correctly on the needle. It's just I can't forget to do this part and I usually catch it because it'll be super tight to knit into um, and you'll go wait a minute what did I do? Oh yeah that's right I, I have to knit this through the back loop because the stitch is on backwards or I don't even know how to word that but you know what I mean. So I'm just going to knit through this, and again very fiddly, so it does take practice so that you don't drop your stitches, and, and you usually want to start a sock when you're not going to be disturbed or bothered or bumped or have a dog jump in your lap and all of that, or a cat, because um, this is really, really fiddly. So you kind of want to do this when you're not going to be bothered. And then after this, it's easy peasy regular sock knitting. So all I'm doing is moving my needle back up, and I'm just going to the other side. And then I just knit another round to start my my toes. So I'm just going to knit around, just like normal, all the way around. And then I'm going to mark the beginning of my round and I'll show you guys how I do that. And then we're going to start toe increases. 
So, so again, you have to have sock knitting experience. It's preferable you have knitting in the um, with magic loop experience before you start um, knitting socks on the round. Because when you first start doing magic loop, it can be fiddly just to do magic loop, much less um, learning how to do two socks at a time toe up. So this is just for folks who are like, hey, I've knit socks, I've knit magic loop, how does Allie do it? And this is how Allie does it. And I will link videos on how to do magic loop by, or I'm sorry, Judy's Magic Cast On by Judy. And you really don't, I mean, I'm sure there's videos out there for magic loop, but um, I won't link, in, link any of those. You guys can just find what you need if you need to look up magic loop. Okay, that's one side. I'm going to do the other side, and then I'll show you how much fabric I have. So again, if you're going to knit um, socks, or you're trying to learn to knit socks, I would make um, a pair out of worsted weight, and I would make it as a traditional sock, so that you can get used to sock construction and all of that. And then do all of that practice, practice, practice before you try to do it on teeny tiny little needles with teeny tiny little yarn. And then I would start with one at a time, cuff down or, t or toe up, but one at a time, you know, so that you can get your sock fitting down, which would be, you know, um, based on my gauge, how many stitches do I need for my foot size, and is this fitting right, or should I go down so I can get a tighter fit? Make a few pairs of socks, and then um, once you get some of that sock knitting experience in, and you know what you like, what you prefer, your family members, all of that. If you're making socks for them, then then try the two at a time. But you'll definitely know when you're ready. Don't force it, because you'll just be miserable and frustrated. I even started out. I tell this story all the time. I never even thought I'd ever make socks. You know, things change. Skill levels change. Um, I thought it was dumb to make socks because I'm like, why put that much work in something you're going to have to put on your feet? Yeah, never in a million years. And now I've knit like, I don't know, 80 pairs of socks by now. Okay, so now I'm just knitting up the other side. And it is a little fiddly. you got, fiddly. You got to watch them cords and keep those two socks separate. So you see how I have one sock here and one sock here. So I am just going to knit up the other side, or actually did I do that already, hold on let me count, I might be distracted, yes I did, so I'm actually at the beginning of my round, because I wasn't paying attention, so I'm going to consider this the beginning of my round, and you can see how much fabric I have, that's my toe forming, and you see now I don't have to do a Kitchener stitch, because I hate Kitchener, that's another reason why I do them toe up, and Another reason I do them toe up is because you can use, you can make the sock as long as you need. You can use up as much yarn as you want when you do the cuff, and you can try the socks on as you go to make sure they fit. So, but anyways, here's my marker. I use these kind of clip markers, and I mark the very beginning, so I know the beginning of my round. And I always face this closed part towards the beginning of my round and this open part is the back. So because it's hard to tell in the beginning, you don't have a lot of fabric. So I always know if I look at this side, it's the beginning. If I'm looking at this side, that's the back. That's not the beginning of my round. This is the beginning of my round. It's facing this needle. This is the beginning of my round. That's just a little trick I do. And as the sock gets bigger, of course, you can move it up, and then it's obvious where your, your beginning of your round is at that point. It's just really hard in the beginning because it's so tiny. Okay, so there's a lot of maintenance. There's a lot of cord maintenance and a lot of yarn maintenance in the beginning. But trust me, all this fiddling will decrease considerably once you get your uh, past your toes. So now you want to start doing your increases. Okay, so there's a couple different ways to do increases. Again, I'm not teaching you how to make socks. But what I'm going to do just for ease is I'm going to knit one and I'm going to do a knit front back. Okay, I used to do a make one left and a make one right. 
on the appropriate side, front and back, in order to get that, that wedge shape going. But then I realized it didn't really matter. I still got a nice wedge with a knit front back, and a knit front back was actually easier on my hands. So at this point, you do whatever you need to do to make your toe. And see here, I'm doing a knit front back, knit, OK? Because now we're doing our increases. So and then I do the same thing. You do the exact same thing on both socks at the same time. So when I'm over here, I'm going to go ahead and do a knit one and a knit front back. And then across the last two stitches. front back and a knit one. Oopsie doodles, lost it. Knit front back, knit one. Okay. And I don't like the way that, no, it's okay. Um, and then we're going to flip it. We're going to do the same on the other side. So the only difference between the knit front back and the knit, make one left and make one right is basically in my opinion, the make one left and the make one right is cleaner. So if you like a very clean edge to your toe, you're probably going to want to do the make one left and the make one right. And the way you do that with your doing toe up is you look at it this way. Your toe is going to be going this way. So you want to make one right. This side's going to go this way. You want to make one left. And the same thing when you flip it. That way you don't get confused. Just remember, this side's always going to go to the right. This side's going to go left because you're working toe up if you keep forgetting which side's which. So now we're on the back side and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to knit one, make one, I mean, knit one, knit front back. For me, because that's what I'm doing. That's a particular increase. And for me, then make one left and make one right is cleaner, but I don't really care because the knit front back, it doesn't look sloppy per se. You know what I mean? Not enough to really deter me from doing it this way. So it's just personal preference. All right, and then we're going to head over to the back of the first sock. So we're almost at the end of our round. And you will get um, the yarn tangled in the beginning because I don't try to manage my yarn right now. I have techniques later that will stop you from, from tangling it. But right now, I'm just getting this sucker started, and I don't care. I will untangle the balls manually. But I will show you, once I get a toe started, how I manage the yarn so it doesn't tangle. Oops, split the yarn. All right, and as you can see, it's fiddly. And it's teeny tiny, so again, you need sock knitting experience, you need sock knitting experience on small needles, small yarn, and magic loop. Otherwise, you're going to be uber frustrated. Alright, so I'm going to turn it around, and we're at the beginning of our round. And remember, I know I'm at the beginning of my round, because this marker is facing me. So I know this needle is the beginning of my round. And you can see we're already getting some fabric, and if you squish it down, you can see you're starting to get some shaping started on each one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an increase round, knit a plain round, do an increase round, knit a plain round, do an increase round, knit a plain round, until I have 30 stitches per side or 60 stitches total because that's what fits me in this particular yarn on this particular needle gauge and this is for me because my boyfriend does not wear pink and purple. So we're going to go ahead and do that and I will come back after the toe is complete to show you where we are and then how do I how I do my yarn management. So I'll be right back. Okay guys, I'm back. Sorry, my tripod is still acting up. Oh, so let me just kind of get into my chair here. So here we are with the yarn. I'm going to try to lift this without having my camera fall down. Alright, cool. So 
here's the yarn. So you can see I've worked through everything I had wrapped up around the edges. I, almost. There's some on this ball. But I am now done with the toes. And you guys can see that just doing the increases, I'm at 30 a piece on each side. And that's because that's what I use. So again, I'm not teaching you how to make socks. You should already know your sock recipe. You should already know what you need, etc., etc. I'm just showing you that this is what it looks like when I've gotten past the toes and how I get them on the needles. So we started with the Judy's Magic Cast On. Now I can move this clip up because uh, I have room to do so. I have fabric. And as you can see, our stripes match. So I kind of showed you how I match my stripes and all of that. So our ends were only off by, what was it, like an inch? Because remember, I had it perfectly started, but then one of them slipped a little bit when I was messing with it. So being that far off, um, my stripes are still pretty lined up. But keep in mind, that's also because my gauge, you know what I mean, my gauge is fairly small. So if you have a bigger gap between the two, when you're first getting it on the needles, like if you have two or three inches difference, um, you need to rip it out and start over if you want your stripes to line up because at that point it would be you'd have one stripe starting before or, at, or after the other stripe if you know what I mean the, sh the stripes would be off um, so that's why I use the technique I do where I fold it and put one outside and then make sure I start in the exact same spot on each sock is to get the stripes to be consistent so being an inch off doesn't really affect anything um, but any more than that, like two or three, I think you'd probably have your stripes not line up as much. But you can see it's pretty, pretty there. So I will notice that, you know, I do start one um, on one sock a little sooner than the other, the color changes, but it's, again, it doesn't affect it. You still have the matching stripes. So um, I like to match my stripes. I do do them toe up. And this is where we're at now. And so all I have to do is all my increases are finished. I just work in the round. So what I wanted to talk about was yarn management. Because, as you can see, your yarn will get tangled. So I'm going to raise this up a little bit more and try to see if I can get my tripod to work. Hold on. i got to unplug the computer. That would help. <clears throat> Okay, so that's a little more distance, and I think my camera won't fall. So, when you're working, there's a way to untangle. So, let's say you get twisted because you're working with two strands of yarn. You can hold a strand off each ball and just hold it up away from a table and just let it spin. So, you could hold it by each ball, hold it up out. Mine's not twisted right now, but you could see how you could just hold it up one hand you know one strand from one ball in each hand and let it unspin okay you don't have to do this with the balls you know what I'm saying which I've seen people do and I'm I'm like no 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 you just hold it up past where it's twisted and let it just untwist okay like that just you know worse because you'll have more more twists in there that's an easy way to untangle. So you just have to lift it up away from everything and just let it twist, untwist. But um, there's a way to avoid getting the getting the yarn tangled. So I'm making sure it's untwisted now. So hold on, give me a second. I think I only have like maybe one twist left. So I'm going to go ahead and untwist that. But a way to avoid that is to work one side and flip it back like this. So when you work one side, you flip it this way, work the other side. Flip it this way, work one side, flip it this way. You don't do this, which a lot of us do when we're not thinking. We just turn it and turn it and turn it, and we end up with a big tangly mess. So that's one of my techniques is I just flip work this way and instead of turning it all the way around I flip back and so what you're not doing is kind of twisting untwisting twisting untwisting twisting untwisting and it's not going into a big spiral 
Um, you'll see what I mean if you if you try it out yourself. Um, and since I've been messing with it, it's getting really twisted. So you can see here, I'm just holding both strands away from anything it can bump into, and it will untwist. And that's just an option. If you don't want to worry about flipping in one direction and then back like this, you just want to turn it and turn it and turn it and not worry about it. That's what you could do. Just pull those strands, let it untwist on its own. Um, I've gotten into the habit now of going one way, you know, just doing that flip. But I don't do it every time. Sometimes I'll forget and I'll just have to untwist it the other way. So that's just how I manage the yarn. So you can put both of these in a bag. I've now got it to the point where it's almost pulling out of the middle for both. I got a couple of strands left on this one from when we had to line up the color. But eventually they're both going to pull out of the top like this. You can put them in a bag, not worry about that tangling, and then you just have to worry about your yarn management this way to prevent tangling. Um, as for your cord, your cord is, you know, once it gets to this point, your cord is much easier to manage. Um, but if you find that, like, this is flipping up into your way when you're working, all you have to do is twist one of the needles. And it will twist that needle and it will flip this downward. Okay, so if it's in, totally in your way, flipped up in your way, you can't, you know, push it out of the way, it keeps bouncing up, just twist one of the needles and it will move, it will flip this down. Because um, that's another problem sometimes when you're messing around with your, your cable, it can really get in your way and you can just flip it down. Um, but that's it. You know, from now on you're just going to knit in the round, untangle your yarn every once in a while, um, make sure you count your stitches um, after your toe to make sure you didn't miss an increase. Um, you could pop it in a bag, take it out with you when you're out talking to people or in a knit group or a crochet group and just work and you don't have to think because at this point you're just going to be knitting around and around and around and around and maybe untangling every once in a while so um, that's what I do and then when I hit the heel I do a, a short row heel and what you do when you hit the heel is you just work one at a time so let's say I was getting ready to do the heel here on this side but then what you would do, because I kind of want to have a visual for this, and again, sorry it's blurry when I'm moving, but it's just the type of camera I have. I don't have a high um, quality camera, so it doesn't track movement very well. Okay, so that I knit to the end of it, and then what I do is I just work back and forth on this heel, and you just leave this one hanging and ignore it and you work your short, short row heel and then by the time you're done with your heel on this sock you're going to come across and work on the other sock you'll be in position just to come right on over and then you just do the same thing and work this sock all by itself ignore this one until it's all finished and then you just pick them all up and start working in the round again so um, you know that's the advantage of having a, a short row heel is that you don't have to fiddle around or take a sock off um, off of this needle and put it on another needle to do you know all these separate things like a, a gusset um, heel flap gusset type of situation but like I said you can do a heel flap gusset it's just really fiddly and they do have books on that and and help on that and probably some videos somewhere on that um, I just don't like to deal with that because it's just too fiddly for me to try to do a gusset with the gusset increases um, with this on two at a time. So I just do a short row heel. I just and then once your heel's turned, you're in the round again, and you just finish the length of your sock. And, you know, finish the cuff, bind one a sock off. You know, on one side, come around, bind it off on the other side. You know, bind this one off on one side, bind it off on the other side, and they're both off. So. You just bind off in the round as well, and when you're done, they're both they're both finished. So, um, sorry about the lighting. The lighting got kind of dark in here, but yeah. So as you can see, that's what I do. Um, and now that I'm ready, I can actually knit across this one and stick them in a bag. 
for when I want to um, start working on my April socks because these are my April socks but I have to finish my March socks first but I just wanted to get these started and since I was going to start them I figured I'd show you because people are curious um, you know how I do it in particular and everybody has kind of their own way of doing things and they have their own habits and their own way of setting things up or what works best for them um, I know for a fact that this toe works well for me so I keep the toe the same and then um, the heel the fish lips kiss heel is usually what I do and because that one fits me nicely and my boyfriend nicely and so I really don't have to mess around with any other short row heels uh, you know, if you get bored, you can always, there's a lot of nice short row heels out there, so I could always switch it up and try a different heel and still be able to do it two at a time, you know, the same way I normally do it. I just like the fish lips because I have it memorized and it's just really easy. And I'll link that down below too. It's a pattern. Um, it's a really good pattern. It's actually a book, like a booklet um, from a gal who... Oh, I can't remember her name. What is her name? Well, anyways, I'll link it below, but she actually, the Fish Lips Kiss Heel, the last time I checked, was like a dollar to buy the pattern, but she gives you a, a nice book about sock knitting. So if you're a new sock knitter, I suggest buying the Fish Lips Kiss pattern just because of the extra information she gives you and tips for sock knitting. Okay? So that's it. I get them, and you can see my toe right there. See? No Kitchener. I don't have to, to do any of that. And I'm going to try to brighten this up a little bit because it got really overcast outside. Um, so, you know, I don't have to Kitchener. I don't have to worry about this at all. When I'm done with my socks, I'm done with my socks after the bind off. So, unless I do an afterthought heel, which I don't do very often. So, that's why I enjoy this one so much because you can, because the striping does all the work for you, it creates all the interest right here. That's the fun part. And with these, I like the Croy too because they don't show you pictures of how it's going to turn out. Um, if they do show you pictures like a generic one, not really for your particular colorway. So it's kind of fun to see how they pop out because I didn't know it was going to do um, these thin stripes even though I pulled the yarn out to line it to match it. So that's the fun part with some of these self-striping is you can do a really simple sock um, and still have fun because you get to watch the color changing. So, so that's it, you guys. And like I said, this is not a sock tutorial, but if you have some questions, I could possibly help or point you in the right direction. Um, but this is really for people who already know how to knit socks, just showing, you know, how I do two at a time, just my particular habits and all of that, and what's easier for me or what is easiest for me at this point in my sock knitting um, adventure. So, all right guys, I will talk to you later. Bye.